Our next presenter, Lillian Wong, is joining us from over the pond in the United States. Uh, I believe we're about five hours behind from where you're located, Lillian. Uh, Lillian is Professor and Chair of the Department of Interior Architecture at the Rhode Island School of Design, and her interest in teaching in a subject led her to co-found the Journal on Design Interventions and Adaptive Reuse, which she also authors to explore extending the lives of buildings. Uh, moreover, she was recognised by Design Intelligence in 2018, 2019 and 2019 to 2020 as one of the top 25 most of my design educators in the US. So that is quite an accolade. Um, Lillian, um, very welcome to the uh, STEAM uh, International Conference. Um, and I, I'd like to ask you now to uh, make your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Clayton, and thank you uh, to uh, Laura and Emily for inviting me to be here this afternoon. Um, it was wonderful to hear Tom's presentation, which sets the stage for a discussion of creative technologies. Um, I will be focusing specifically on innovative technologies through an in-depth discussion of a single project that has evolved from academic research to community engagement and then policy and government. Uh, so today I hope to take you through this long and unexpected journey that began uh, in the classroom. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Are you able to see the entire screen? Uh, yes, thank you, Lillian. Okay. Uh, the work uh, is seated in the Department of Interior Architecture at the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, with three graduate degrees and one undergraduate degree, our department focuses specifically on adaptive reuse, the reuse of our built environment from the scale of a room to an entire building and even neighborhoods. This particular design focus means that we intervene in existing contexts to design for the needs of a new condition, time, and society. Our work entails designing for change and unfamiliar conditions in which we propose solutions that question familiar premises. So I'm delighted to share with you in detail the work called Projecting Change, in which we attempted to solve a problem of the future, but more importantly, try to acclimate a general public to innovative solutions that would be required now to preserve the future. In 1962, Hanna Barbera Productions released an animated sitcom about a family of the future. This nuclear family of two parents, two children, a dog, and a robot maid lived in a futuristic galaxy of spaceships where the usual domestic drama was depicted through scenarios of daily life, and in this case, assisted by machines. These imagined devices shown here from left to right were the precursors of the cell phone, a telehealth appointment, and a robotic vacuum cleaner. Devices that are familiar objects 60 years later in our post-pandemic society. What would those viewers from 1962, with what they knew and understood then, have done if any of our devices from 2021 showed up in their homes? Despite the predictions shown in the Jetsons, our familiar devices would most likely have been deemed aliens from outer space and outright rejected. This is a familiar aspect of the human condition in which it is difficult to accept what we don't understand. It is the same with the robotic vacuum as with architectural visions that are tailored to a future condition. Innovative solutions for tomorrow require one to suspend belief and accept what they cannot understand and cannot yet see. In the half century since 1962, the scope of design has expanded with different and more urgent purpose. Today, design often takes on the additional role of solving the problems of society. In the US and many parts of the world, some of our most compelling problems include, of course, the pandemic, climate change, food insecurity, migration, and so on. In 2017, we asked our students to take on the challenge of designing for sea level rise, but more importantly, to convince a community to accept their innovative design ideas for addressing a future in 2100. 
Projecting Change was a design studio that I co-taught in 2017 with two colleagues, Michael Bruegel and Marcus Berger, and 17 graduate students from our Master of Art in Adaptive Reuse program. The studio was what we call in the US a sponsored studio, meaning that we were awarded a grant by a foundation to investigate a specific issue. In this case, the Van Buren Charitable Foundation and the Newport Restoration Foundation jointly sponsored the study of the effects of sea level rise on a historic neighborhood in Newport, Rhode Island. The project was taught in our post-professional program for architects who come to RISD for only a year to focus intently on adaptive reuse. The program culminates in a spring semester project that takes on real life issues on adaptive reuse together with a real life client. In this particular case, we had two clients. First, the members of the coastal neighborhood threatened by sea level rise. And second, our sponsors, the two foundations. And here we had an interesting twist in that our sponsor requirements were not wholly design related. They assumed that there would be design, of course, but their challenge was for us to instigate a discussion amongst the neighbors on sea level rise and their future. If at the end of the grant period, the members of the community talk to each other about sea level rise, we would have succeeded in the eyes of our grantors. Our site is in the city of Newport, one of America's oldest historic cities. Founded on the edge of the Narragansett Bay, the city is a treasure trove of built heritage, all protected by historic preservation guidelines. 986 of Newport's historic structures and 53% of the acreage of Newport's homes are located in the floodplain. We concentrated on the Point neighborhood a small community with homes dating to the American Revolution. This historic neighborhood is situated on a small grid of three streets paralleling the coast by 10 side streets by the edge of the bay, once a bucolic neighborhood by the sea. In the last decade, storms such as the 2012 Hurricane Sandy depicted in the uh, photo on the left would transform the entire coastal area into a lake. As you can see here, a canoe was required to negotiate the historic center of town. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, an American scientific agency within the US Department of Commerce that focuses on the conditions of the oceans, major waterways, and the atmosphere, has recently created maps of the US's coastline and the impact on it from future mean sea levels. At the time of our project in 2017, the historic homes of the Point neighborhood were already experiencing flooding from precipitation, storm surge, and extreme high tides. NOAA's high model projections predicted one foot or 30 centimeters of sea level rise by 2035 and three feet, 91 centimeters by 2065, and almost seven feet, 213 centimeters by 2100. The built heritage of the historic Point neighborhood, which already floods with every severe storm, will be underwater without a careful plan for its future. Today in the Point neighborhood, basements flood regularly, and one is liable to step out of one's front door directly into pooling water on most rainy days. Our students began their design studio with a survey of the neighbors. Knocking on doors, they asked some basic questions about sea level rise of the different citizens. Their responses, variations of yes, there is sea level rise, but I would be long gone by the time it happens, corroborated national polling on similar questions. The Pew Research Center indicates that half or more than half of those polled in 2019 believe that climate policies do more harm than good or worse still make no difference. These point neighbors who now regularly step into flooded basements and sopping doorsteps hold exactly the same way. This made us realize that the goal stipulated by our grantors to ignite a discussion on sea level rise amongst the neighbors would be quite a challenge. Our study of sea level rise at the Point neighborhood was complicated by the fact that it was founded in the 17th century and part of the Newport Historic District Zoning created in 1964 and designated a National Historic Landmark District in 1968. 
The neighborhood is characterized by 18th century houses, such as these on the main road, Bridge Street. They're all built directly on grade, with the main level of the house at almost street level. Therefore, the properties needed to comply with the city's historic preservation rules and regulations. The houses in the Point neighborhood, however, are not only characterized by their age, they're also notable as all being sited below the flood elevation. Because of this factor, these historic properties are also subject to the rules and regulations of the city's hazard mitigation plan. In particular, this plan addressed floodplain management for the entire neighborhood. Such management was naturally tied to insurance which is, in turn is based on gain and loss. Flooding of homes were found to have increased significantly in a study over a span of 40 years. With the rising of the mean sea level directly related to the numbers of flooded homes, the mean sea level rising 19 inches or 48 centimeters since 1970 equated to a 155% increase in the numbers of flooded properties. In this scenario, earned premiums were outpaced by the avalanche of insurance claims resulting from the more and more frequent climate events, such as hurricanes Katrina, Sandy, and Harvey. A floodplain mitigation plan carries the purpose of lessening the impact of such claims. In Newport's floodplain mitigation plan, new homeowners were required to raise their houses above the, flood, the base flood ele elevation Insurance companies would benefit and homeowner policies would be less costly. The impact on architectural heritage, however, was not considered. In the Point neighborhood, where all the houses are below the flood elevation, compliance would destroy the historic fabric of this community of two-story homes on grade. On the left, you see an original home built in the 18th century. On the right, the home of a new owner that has been elevated seven risers above grade. The elevation of a historic property to address flooding is entirely at odds with the aim of preservation, which is to keep these areas from change through the rules and regulations of historic preservation. In Newport, as in other cities uh, in the US and in the UK, preservation guidelines did not address the imposition placed by flood mitigation requirements. New owners who followed the floodplain mitigation plan created a conundrum for the preservationists, as such actions would not be in keeping with the historic designation of the neighborhood. Some houses that have new owners are now raised any distance from three to seven feet or 91 to 230 centimeters above the flood elevation. This is termed lollipopping due to the various heights now visible on many of the Point neighborhood streets where the characteristic on-grade structures are slowly disappearing. These interventions are not in keeping with the principles of a National Historic Landmark District, but to keep the built heritage of the Point above water would require more than even the raising of structures a few feet. Herein lies the clash of two opposing phenomena, historic preservation, and sea level rise. Preservation seeks to sustain a past state of being, while sea level rise changes and renders the present state unsustainable. This clash affects not only historic neighbor at Newport, but all areas of built coastal heritage where preservation regulations prevent the implementation of sea level rise strategies. What can we do to ameliorate these differences? This was the problem that our students faced in the Point neighborhood in understanding how to design between the mandates of two masters. Let me briefly digress from Newport to tell you a tale of two Venices that would illustrate these differences in terms of construction and implementation. This, of course, is Venice, Italy. It is listed on UNESCO's World Heritage Site and protected by many different regulations that share the objective to protect and maintain it as an artistic achievement, as an influence on the development of art and architecture, as an archeological site, as an outstanding example of a semi-lacostral habitat. 
Many governing bodies collaborate to manage change so as to keep Venice as much as possible the historic city founded in the fifth century and first inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List in 1987. While Venice has always been under threat from Aqua Alta and flooding, it was hit in November 2019 by the highest tide in more than 50 years. In response to this catastrophe, the UNESCO World Heritage Center agreed with Italian authorities to conduct an advisory investigation of these issues. In the meantime, citizens of Venice traversed their city on elevated catwalks, hovering over the four foot three inches or 1.3 meters of flood water that had invaded the ground levels and foundations of Venice's built heritage. This is Venice, Louisiana, USA, a small coastal community sited on the banks of the Mississippi River. Located some 70 miles south of New Orleans, its industry includes commercial and sport fishing. In August 2005, New Orleans and its surrounding areas were devastated by Hurricane Katrina, a Category 5 Atlantic hurricane that eventually caused more than 1,800 deaths and 125 billion US dollars in damage. The hurricane devastated New Orleans, where 80% of the city was flooded for weeks, crippling transportation and communication facilities, and leaving tens of thousands of people stranded with little access to food, shelter, or other basic necessities. Hurricane Katrina completely destroyed the community of Venice, Louisiana. There was nothing left to salvage. Since then, the small fishing community has rebuilt for a resilient future through employing unconventional and even extreme strategies. The rebuilt community is drastically different than its pre-Katrina existence. More than half of the new Venice hovers on wood structures or piers high above the beach, while streets have been replaced with boardwalks and jetties. To withstand rising waters, Houses, apartment blocks, and small businesses have been raised on piers up to 15 feet or 4.6 meters above ground. Alternatively, single family homes are built directly in the water, supported by floating foundations, not of historic or cultural significance and unfettered by preservation standards. Venice, Louisiana is a demonstration of the strategies that may be necessary for coastal communities to thrive in future rising seas. Strategies for combating sea level rise on heritage properties, such as Venice, Italy, can be categorized as either defensive or adaptive. Defensive strategies include large-scale infrastructural interventions, such as Venice, Italy's implementation of mobile barriers to defend the city from flooding waters begun in 2003 and pending completion today. Barriers rise out of the water at times of flooding to hold back water until it recedes. This is an example of a remote intervention that does not touch the built heritage itself, but rather protects it from afar. These strategies conform with the premise of preservation in maintaining the artifact in the same relative physical condition over time. In Venice, Louisiana, the use of amphibious foundations, such as that of Elizabeth English and the Boyant Foundation Project, retrofits an existing structure with new foundations that will allow it to float as high as necessary during floods while remaining on the ground in normal conditions. This type of strategy changes the existing structure dramatically. The diametrically opposed strategies at the two Venices demonstrate the difference between structures that are protected by historic preservation and those that are not. In the case of Venice, Italy, it is a strategy limited by the definition of preservation and compromises the foundations of the architectural heritage while the occupants of the city negotiate the high waters. Without preservation limitations, however, the occupants of Venice, Louisiana are enjoying a life in their newly rebuilt buoyant coasting coastal fishing community. In these times of climate change, the critical issue is whether definitions and regulations formulated in the previous era 
oblivious to the pressing issues of climate change and sea level rise, will leave our architectural heritage unprotected through adherence to the mandate of a different time? Or could we learn from the lessons of Venice, Louisiana, and its recovery from the hurricane? These were the questions facing our qu students as they started working in studio. Working in teams, they proposed varying, varying approaches for the future of this neighborhood, illustrating the different solutions to sea level rise. Accepting that the Point neighborhood could not be maintained in its present location in rising seas, the project Memory Trace chose to retreat as a strategy. Assuming future inundation, the project relocates the neighborhood to higher ground, but leaves a memorial consisting of the cast facades of the houses themselves. This proposal maintains the definition of preservation through translocation to another site. In contrast, the project Great Green Blue uses an expansive strategy of both defense and adaptation in order to maintain the Point neighborhood in its historic moment and in situ. A breakwater is proposed to defend the community while a robust system of blue streets and retention ponds are created for accommodating and controlling the influx of water over time. Living with water employs more exper experimental means to maintain the neighborhood exactly as it was. Assuming rising waters, the project proposes to replace all existing building and infrastructural foundations with buoyant ones. As the water rises, the entire neighborhood would rise with it, maintaining the neighborhood as it was, but on top of the water. Obstruct, instead, proposes to update the definition of preservation in the face of climate change. It posits that if the historic community as we know it today is premised on a horizontal configuration on land, why not redefine this relationship through a configuration defined by the water? Obstruct offers a new vertical grid that maintains the relationships of the historic houses to each other by a different axis, the Z. All four design solutions take the point neighborhood together as a community into the future, treading a fine line between preservation and climate change action. But they challenge the status quo especially with a community that did not necessarily believe in the efficacy of climate change policies, or as a matter of fact, in the urgency of climate change itself. In 1601, Caravaggio painted a scene from Christianity, depicting a tale of resurrection, in which the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ appeared to his disciples. The disciple Thomas, who's depicted in the foreground on the right, who missed the first of these appearances, stated, quote, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it, close quote. Caravaggio depicts this very human trait of needing visual proof. With the need to achieve the objective of our studio to ignite a conversation amongst the community on sea level rise, we were inspired by Caravaggio. To appease the doubting Thomases of the Point neighborhood, we looked to creative technologies to help us convince them of sea level rise, the threat to their historic community, and possible solutions for a future with the rising seas. We employed both virtual and augmented reality to display the four projects in a one-day community event. Augmented markers of each project were placed along the streets of the neighborhood. Scanning one of these markers with your phone would place you directly into one of the schemes. For example, a gray, green, and blue marker would allow one to see their street fill up with water and turn blue and the gardens to turn into retaining ponds uh, over time. While an upstruck marker, uh, you would be able to see your house fly into its new position in a vertical historic neighborhood in the sea. Alternatively, virtual reality places you directly 
and immersively into a new surrounding that you can negotiate, as in this example that I'm going to show you. And so this is a, th these are photos uh, of uh, the uh, community using our Oculus headsets. And now I would like to um, share with you what they may have seen. Um, Are you able to see my screen again? Yes, thank you. Yep. And so, for example, um, using uh, using creative technologies, we would be able to uh, let some of those neighbors see what it would be like to go directly from their boat into the Narragansett Bay. They would be able to steer the boat, look up at the surroundings, maybe hear a seagull, look back at the bridge that connects Jamestown to the city of Newport. And then actually from their boat, look back at the point neighborhood right where my cursor is. Or if they wanted to see a higher view, uh, they would be able to go up directly onto the bridge and look down at the neighborhood. Again, this is Newport, and here is the point right on the ocean's edge. So these were some of the, uh, this is an example of what uh, many of those uh, neighbors would be able to see um, using the Oculus headsets and the Google Cardboards uh, that we provided. And so I'm going to take you back to um, my other presentation. My apologies. We can see it again now. Okay. A student team also created a game with the neighborhood as the game board. Players selected their own home as a game piece. The premise was that a storm was bearing down and one had to make decisions on how to prepare for its onslaught. With a brief game span of five to 10 minutes, decisions had to be made quickly. One had options. You could save your own house or participate in a group effort. If you raised your house, you were saved for the first few floods, but eventually you would be isolated without streets, without neighbors, without neighborhood amenities, because you had not invested in saving your community. At the end of the countdown, simulated water floods the game scene to reveal whether or not the players managed to save their neighborhood. How can a community act in times of sea level rise? How can policies be devised? The game addressed these questions in a playful way. Members of the Newport Town Council attended our community event and were very interested in the game and its development as a tool for communicating with the citizens. Neighbors of all ages, members of the local government, church officials, children, teachers, professors, doctors, who rarely, if ever, discussed sea level rise, all of a sudden could, with visualization technology, see what a future with water might look like right in their own backyard. They could see what retreat, defend, or adapt might look like as design strategies. They could now see what they couldn't before. The community came together that day, projecting their future through our design work. As we look to gather consensus on climate change action, visualization might be instrumental for allowing everyone to see into their future so as to take action now. Student ideas are typically ahead of the times. Two years after projecting change, the New York Times wrote about the dilemma of heritage coastal properties based on our project. And in 2020, Almost three years after our project, the city of Newport released groundbreaking guidelines for historic properties, addressing the urgency created by rising waters, 
and the need to elevate historic structures. This recognition of change revolutionized the previous mandate of preservation to maintain historic structures the way they have been for years. We hope that projecting change was a catalyst in this decision. We believe so because our use of visualization through augmented and virtual realities allowed everyone to see beyond what they could understand. In 2007, on a winter morning in Washington, DC, Pulitzer Prize author Thomas Friedman was inspired to write about climate change because he witnessed daffodils blooming months earlier than they should have. The physical presence in winter of these golden spring flowers was physical proof of the effects of climate change. We humans often require such proof to convince us to change. Creative technologies in the form of visualization and cross realities can help us envision that future. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. That was fantastic. That was really remarkable in terms of all the information you gave us there and the, the kind of insights around the impact on climate change, sea level rises, some of those quite dramatic and fantastical solutions that were presented as well uh, by the team that were working on it. Uh, they seem to defy possibility, but in many ways it's almost like that needs to be the reality. So yeah, really interesting stuff there. And it's great to see that use of the, the visualizations um, as, as part of a way to get people to understand what the impact is and can be for local communities. Um, we're hoping to um, get a couple of questions in. Um, I did see that there was something, there was a, a question in around uh, how, um, from a, a kind of arts creative point of view, how, how that could be uh, a source of um, uh, looking at, well, looking at how arts can play a role in, in addressing some of these issues. Is there, is there anything you might want to add into that? That was from Francisca Schenk. Well, I think that um, more and more um, creative technologies are starting to um, make their way into academic curriculum. Um, the issue that we found, because uh, we are currently working on another project using um, more uh, creative technologies than even in projecting change, what we did find is that the public, and so when you do go and do a community engagement event, um, most people have no idea how to scan an image with their phone not to talk about um, you know, uh, using panos and so on. And, and, and so it worked very well in projecting change in that we, we staged a one-day community event. We had students and faculty there to help the public. Um, and so most recently, we, um, we did have a Zoom presentation in May of a new project that we have. And we sent everyone who was attending a set of Google Cardboard and what we thought were elaborate directions on something very, very simple. And there was incredible frustration in that the general public is not able to access the, the software. And so right now, I would say that with, um, with creative technologies, is really bringing the public up to speed. Um, that said, um, I think that designing with creative technologies has become much easier. When we first started designing in 2017, the software was cumbersome and took uh, quite a bit of work on the part of our students. Um, I just purchased the new 2020 iPad from Apple or 2021. And you are able to do many things now with a simple click. Um, and so one of our student projects from last year, uh, a student decided to use Enscape and create um, a scannable image very, very easily. And um, it's not as sophisticated as what we did with all the software, but it is accessible. Um, and so I would say that, you know, the community, the general public is catching up and it, it will, will have caught up soon. Um, but I think that in academia, it would be great to understand the trajectory of that catching up and to jump on, um, on using the technologies uh, as we have done in solving uh, real life issues through design. Thank you. And we'll take one more question that's come through the Q&A. Um, uh, it's from an anonymous attendee that says, great presentation. Do you think the weight of climate change reversal lies with us as individuals, uh, i.e. carbon footprint, 
for large corporations? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Um, I think it has to be everyone. Um, certainly, uh, we can place the burden of guilt on the large corporations, and they have larger burdens of guilt uh, than the rest of us. But um, I believe that if we add up all the individual footprints of each of us and what we do every day, um, it would be quite a lot given the population uh, demographics that we have. And so I think that it is, it is really uh, in everyone's best interest now um, to work on that. And I think that our polling of the point neighbors showed us that most people think that it is a term it is coming, but they're not actually doing anything now uh, for mm. the future. Yeah, thank you. That was quite a fundamental question, that one as well, uh, more beyond the uh, the, the, the subject of, of CREATE, but which you've addressed through, through the presentation. Really fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Lillian Wong. Um, I'm sure there are people at home giving you a virtual round of applause as we speak. Um, so, uh, yes, thank you very much for giving your presentation. Thank you, Clayton.